Hello and welcome to Moment Photography. My name is Ross and I've been a professional photographer since 2006. Now today I would like to talk about a unusual lens, it's a macro lens. Now you may say, well macro lens is an un unusual lens, but this lens is what I would call the mother of macro lenses. So this is what you might think of a typical macro lens. This is a 100 millimeter uh, 2.8 IS, so image stabilized um, macro lens. Now this lens is a one-to-one -one scale lens, okay? So we've got that one there, but this one here, this beast, this one is a one-to-five scale macro lens. Now it looks quite small actually when you compare the two of them, but the difference is because this goes to five, five times magnification that is, you need to have a, an awfully long barrel to the lens. Now I actually bought this lens back in 2013. So I've had it seven years, but I haven't actually used it a great deal. Um, now I have been using it more recently, hence why I'm making this video. But the reason why I haven't been using it much in all of those seven years, and I've actually had more use out of this one, which I only bought two years ago. The reason why I haven't used it much is because it's fiendishly hard to use. I was actually at the point where I almost, I almost sold this lens. And then when I worked out how to get the best out of it, I certainly didn't want to sell it. So these actually range uh, in price from about £700 to £1,100. Now this lens, which I bought a couple of years ago, this is a much easier lens to use. Both lenses produce excellent results, but this is just much, much harder to get excellent results with. And this one, interestingly, isn't actually a professional grade lens, although it certainly feels like it is. And I would say that the quality of the images, when you know how to get most from it, are excellent. Let's give you some details of this. So this one weighs uh, 710 grams. Um, when it's this size, it's 98 millimeters long and it goes up to 230 millimeters long. And as you can see, it's got a, um, a tripod mount on it as well. So you definitely want to use that tripod mount um, if you've got any lens where it's got such a length to it because of the extra leverage of the lens, it try, the weight of it tries to pull it down. It's definitely better to use a tripod mount um, on the lens rather than the camera. And this is a manual focus lens, which might seem a bit strange. Um, you can still buy this lens. It's not like it's a lens from the 90s or something. It's designed to be manual focus. It's, it's all to do with technique, really. Now, uh, these lenses, so this one is a, a 65 millimeter uh, macro lens and this one is a 100 millimeter macro lens. Now that does make a big difference to how you use these lenses and the sort of results you can get. So with this one, because it's a longer focal length, what it means is that if the subject matter is in front of the lens, I can have that subject matter a little bit further away so if you've got some little bug or fly that's really skittish, as soon as you start to approach it, it's gonna to want to fly off or crawl away or, or move or something. So if you've got a macro lens, which has got a long focal length, then that means you don't have to get quite as close and it makes it much easier, much easier work and distance um, to the subject matter. When you start at uh, one times magnification, you'll have to get the subject closer than with this lens because this is only 65 millimeters. But as you increase the magnification to two, three, four, and five times, you have to get even closer again. So when you get up to five times magnification, you can actually find that you're practically on top of the bug. And if you're trying to light uh, the subject, so you, maybe you've got a flash on the camera up here, then you can actually cast a shadow from the barrel of the lens when you're you know, five times magnification. So that can create problems. Now, as I said, this lens is 700 pounds. 
But because of the cost, you'll find that there will be people who will look for a cheaper alternative, and that's totally fine. And especially if you're starting out in macro photography, you know, you may not be at a particularly high level or very good technically with getting the results that you want. So it's, it's better to start off with something, you know, which might not be fantastic quality, but is cheap. And I've seen people who've used a, a normal zoom lens and they've turned it around and used an adapter and attached that to their camera. Now, the reason I mention this is because when you do this, yes, by all means you can do that and you can get um, some really good macro photos with you know a little bit of fiddling around and you know jury pokery trying to make it work. Um, but what you may find is that when you plug this into your camera, that the aperture ring would be a manual version. So the aperture only changes when you physically turn the aperture ring. So what that means is if you are taking a photo of something and you want a uh, really as deep a depth of field as you can possibly get, then when you're looking through the camera to see what you're photographing, if you're using, for example, say F16, the viewfinder is going to be really, really dark. But with this one, this lens, um, as with many other Canon or certainly newer Canon lenses, um, when you look through the lens, you're seeing the maximum aperture available. So this is a 2.8, um, an f 2.8 lens. So if I'm wanted to take a photo at f 16, whilst I'm looking through the camera, I'm seeing it with an aperture of f 2.8. So that allows much more light to come in for me to compose my shot. But then when, when the shutter actually goes and uh, the camera actually takes a photo, when you press the shutter button, it'll close down to, you know, f 16, if that's what you've chosen. So you'll get the result you want, but you'll be able to see it using a much larger aperture, which makes it much easier. So if you were using some, janky setup where you have to use a manual aperture ring that's going to create all sorts of problems when you're trying to work with uh, the bug or fly you know whatever it is your caterpillar or something you're trying to photograph unless you've got some really really powerful lighting as in constant lighting on the subject matter so you can get enough light in the lens to see now i would heartily recommend either of these but this is going to be best for probably 95% of people. This is for people who are really, really into macro and you know, really uh, interested in pursuing it properly um, and opening up a whole new world really. But you can do an awful lot just for this one. Um, but as I said, the, the problem with this one is the depth of field because as you get closer and closer to the subject by extending the barrel and going to up to five times, this, the depth of field is incredibly small and it makes it very, very difficult to work with. Now there are some other challenges with this lens. If it wasn't hard enough already, um, you'll find that with using a digital camera, when you're starting to use very small aperture sizes, then you'll start to see dust potentially appearing in your images. When you start to get really great pictures with this lens, you're going to just want to clean your uh, sensor straight away to clear out all that debris that's showing up in, in your photos and ruining them, basically. And the other thing is that when you start to use a smaller aperture, because you want to get that maximum depth of field that you can, you'll start to introduce something called diffraction. Now, diffraction, um, if you imagine it like, let's say you're aperture is like a pinhole. Now when that light goes through that hole, it actually kind of slightly splays as it goes through. Um, now when you're using a larger aperture, it, it happens, but it, it's such a smaller degree, you don't really see it. But when it comes to a much smaller aperture, like a really small aperture, then it starts to become more apparent and your images start to lose sharpness just a little bit, but you're probably not really gonna see that until you're up to around about 22, um, F22 on a full frame sensor camera. 
if you're using a crop frame sensor then you're going to find your seed diffraction earlier so maybe f f11 or something like that possibly and if you're using four thirds camera it's going to be even lower again so I mean, experiment with whatever camera it is you're using, but just be aware that when you start to use a smaller aperture, at a certain point, you will start to see diffraction. So you've just got to try and find that sweet spot. Another thing is camera shake, especially if you're using uh, five times, up to five times magnification in your macro. But with this one, it's just the one times, so it's relatively manageable, but it has also got built-in image st stabilization, um, so you can switch that on and off, and um, that'll help you. Now, as I say, I don't particularly use the autofocus much. I tend to prefer just kind of leaning forward and back to affect my focus, because if you start to use autofocus, it can actually make things worse. Okay, so here's what it looks like on a camera body. So this is my Canon 5D Mark III camera. Now I say um, I tend to use, um, obviously this one I have to use in manual focus, but this one I choose to use in manual focus. And I say I do that um, because I've got more control, but there will be, when you are using this lens, um, there are some instances where you will want to use um, autofocus uh, and also the image stabilization say for example if you've got might be um, you're looking at a caterpillar on a branch which is crawling along and because it's constantly moving you need to be constantly moving too and as you are imagine you've got this lens on here as you are trying to take the photo you might be swaying you might be swaying slightly back and forward and um, you need the camera to compensate for that and adjust. Um, so that's when it would be good to use um, autofocus and the image stabilization. But with this one, because you are dealing with such higher magnifications and the room for error is much smaller, then this one is better suited for, well, Actually, I hesitate to say better suited for a tripod because I do actually use this handheld too, but I probably wouldn't use it above three times magnification for handheld macro photos, just because that depth of field is so tiny. Um, so as I said, when I first got this lens, I got it in 2013 and for a long time, it barely got used. I almost sold it and uh, I got frustrated with it. And I was thinking maybe I should use the money for this lens towards something I'll use more often. But when I did finally have that eureka moment and work out how to best use it, you know, it really made me think about what I was gonna photograph and the best techniques to use. Now, what made the difference was using flash. Now, when I first was using this, lens i think the first thing i found it was just in this lounge it was a some husk of a of a spider that you know a, a spider that had shed its skin and i thought well it's not particularly attractive but that could be something i can photograph and um you know as a test and uh then i, I think i found a a dead fly or something or, or maybe another spider and you know i i tried to take pictures of them as best I could. But when I was doing that, I think first of all, I may have tried handheld, realized it was an, almost impossible, and then got the tripod out. And and then I was finding that I couldn't get enough light on the subject. Um, so I'd have to use a really long exposure, or I'd, maybe I didn't like the light on the subject. So I would then have to introduce flash. Now, as you can see from the photos I'm showing you now, uh, at first I tried using a couple of flash guns uh, propped up and pointing in the direction of the subject matter but because I was using flash guns um, without any sort of diffusion on them the light I got was pretty harsh and pretty horrible but I also another thing I did was I also experimented with also experimented with this gadget here now 
this is um, something which allows you to incrementally change the position of your camera on your tripod. So I can adjust the camera in two directions. So if I put this on the camera, it's a bit tricky to get on. Cause it's so such an awkward shape. There we go. So let's say that's on our tripod and I can go left and right, see? And you've got these markings on here so you can see you know, how far you've moved and be very precise about it. I'll say that with a bit of a caveat. Um, and then we can go, let's see, how can I hold this? Then we can go forward and, I'll have to hold it here, forward and back, okay. And I think this is a kind of a locking mechanism, so it makes it a bit harder to move. Um, now, I've had mixed results with this. Um, I think the problem is, I think you can get good results, but the mo one of the problems you'll encounter with using something like this, I mean, this is just something quite cheap off of uh, that well-known auction site. And um, you've got lots of um, connection points within this, um, within the engineering of how it's made. So you've got a, a little bit of play. So when you've got your camera on here, you're adjusting your buttons and things. And if you were taking a photo and you're actually pressing the camera, just delicately touching it can be enough to <clears throat> to move the framing and, and the uh, plane of focus of your image and for it to go out of focus. So this becomes problematic, um, especially if you're dealing with five times magnification anyway. It's a bit more forgiving if it's less than that. Um, but with that in mind, what you're best to do is, uh, there's a number of things you can do actually. You can, obviously, first of all, you put your camera on a tripod, so that's helping. And then the next thing is you might want to put your uh, camera uh, settings on a, on a timer. Uh, but even better than that is if you use a cable release. And then to go a step again is when you lock the mirror up. So all of these things will prevent you from having to touch the camera and if you use the mirror lockup it will mean that there won't be a jarring inside the camera when the photo is taken. So you need to do everything you possibly can to reduce uh, camera shake and you know motion in your image. Um, now when you're using flash it, it, that does help because um, you're not going to be generally seeing much if any uh, ambient light and that's where you're going to see uh, the motion in the image. Now I've been taking lots of pictures outside and um, so I haven't been using haven't been using this for a long time now actually. Um, so I've typically been hand holding the camera and if you're doing that uh, then you know obviously you're going to move around. Now because I'm using flash even though it's a blazing hot sunny day you know even though it's been really sunny recently I've still been using flash um, because when you're using uh, a really tiny aperture and you're using as fast a shutter speed as you can then you're really cutting out uh, lots of the daylight so then you need to actually introduce extra light but you will get some ambient light um, depending on your settings I try and keep my ISO as low as possible and I decide how much ambient I want to want to allow in the image. Um, so if you uh, have a shutter speed which is relatively slow, so at the moment I'm using uh, two hundredth of a second, but if I allow too much ambient light to get in, then that ambient light is going to start to creep in and appear as camera motion. Now. If you don't allow too much of that in, that then the predominant light source will be the flash, and um, that'll mean that that will freeze the subject. Now, if you if you are using predominantly flash, then as I said, you're going to want to really soften that light. 
So you'll see now a picture of uh, my camera using a diffuser on this lens. This is the macro lens and then I've now got the flash on the camera as well. Now what I've done is I've put some pieces of elastic or elastic bands uh, onto this flash modifier. Now just got this off, um, off the internet, you know, on, a, on a, that well-known auction site again. And um, this actually folds up and it comes with a little bag to put it in, but see, it just unfolds like that. So it goes really small and then it holds nice and firm when it's extended. And uh, you can just slip this on here and I'm gonna put the elastic band around the tripod mount, which is very handy. So that holds up there. Now it's a little bit loose here. So what I did was I put some elastic on here and then that's gonna go in the same sort of place. And that just pulls that back just a little bit. Um, but you can sort of fiddle around with elastic. You maybe wanna change the length or something so you can make it angle further forward if you want to. Because if this is too vertical, then that light as it's coming across, it's gonna be, it's gonna have a harder job trying to get down here effectively. I mean, you, you're definitely gonna get light coming down here, but it's not gonna light it as well if it's very vertical. So you can just change the elastic length or just give it a bit of a, a pull over in this direction and get a bit of an angle. So I, I could potentially actually uh, you know, if I fiddle around a bit more, maybe I could get it to permanently stay in this sort of position. Now, if you are getting very close to a subject, you may find that, you know, this starts to hit a branch or something as you get really close. So, you know, you're gonna have to experiment a bit and work out what works for you, or maybe uh, maybe you'd move the branch um, that the bug is on or something, you know, maybe hold it with one hand and, and then hold the camera the other. And so, you know, you just do what you need to do. But um, this is what I found has worked really well. I've seen other photographers online and they've got some sort of cereal box sticking out here and they've put some tracing paper on the end of it. So they got their flash going through this box and through the tracing paper and that definitely works, don't get me wrong. But this I found is just a, a really simple setup, so cheap. Um, it folds up to next to nothing. It's really light. Um, you can manipulate it a little bit and uh, you just get fantastic results. Now, one thing that's worth mentioning is that if the background is a bit of a distance away from the subject, then that background is gonna go dark very, very quickly because th this flash is gonna illuminate the very immediate area of the subject matter, but anything that's a bit further away, like even say probably a foot away or maybe less, is gonna very quickly go dark and potentially even go black. Now, I, when I first was using this uh, lens, I was you know, messing around with flash then, and as I say, that was a predominant light source then. And I was actually taking them indoors in my lounge, in this lounge, and you know, I had my tripod and my flashes and everything. Now, because there was very little light in this lounge, compared to more recently, I've been going outside in the sunshine and taking pictures, then that meant that the background, or this room, was just completely black or virtually black. So one thing you should consider is if you are going to be using flash as your primary light source, uh, you might wanna consider what you want to put in the background and how you want to light the background as well as the subject. Because if you haven't introduced uh, an extra light source to the background, that background is just gonna be black. Uh, now, and the other thing is that if you do light the background, it's gonna be so out of focus that you can use just any old kind of random household object to create some extra color in your images. So there was one time where I actually found a wasp head in my garden. Now I promise you I didn't kill this wasp, I just found this wasp head just sat on the top of my uh, composting bin. So I don't know, maybe some other insect or some bird had you know, killed this poor wasp and left its head behind. But I thought, well, I'll use that. So I put that head on top of a pin 
and then I put that pin in some blue tack and I put that blue tack uh, uh, you know on my tripod or, or on a stand of some sort and um, you know took a photo but I wanted to have something in the background so I just used the top of a, a water bottle which is bright green and I used that as my background for the image and you know just that made a big difference and, and made it look quite interesting. Now there's a couple of other things I wanted to talk about uh, regarding flash. There is a slightly more professional option because uh, Canon do actually have a flash system which is dedicated um, to this lens. I think it does actually work on one of their other macro lenses. Um, I can't remember which one it is, but I think it's quite a short focal length. But anyway, you can buy that, and uh, you'll have a you know your flash up here and some wires coming out, and it will attach to the flashes, and you can angle the flashes um, because one on either side of the lens, and you can also rotate them around the lens depending on what it is you're photographing. You know, you can you can angle it so that you light it as well as possible. Um, now, it's really quite an expensive system, and given the success I've had with the you know, very simple diffusion setup I've got, I don't really feel a great desire to, to buy uh, such a system actually from Canon. You know, maybe if I tried it out, uh, maybe I'd you know, change my mind and think it's great, but uh, one thing with that system is that you've got very small uh, light sources, you know, the flash is very small, so, I would imagine, without actually trying it, I would imagine that the light would be quite harsh. But, you know, maybe there are some accessories to soften that flash. But, you know, I know that with what I'm using, because it is such a large light source, you get a really nice soft light and it looks very natural, I think. Now, there's so there's those options of making your own sort of janky setup um, or using, you know, the, the same sort of diffuser that I've used, which is a little bit more elegant, or you've got uh, the Canon flash system. Now, the other thing I was gonna just briefly mention though is that you could use off-camera flash because so at the moment, all the uh, times I've been talking about flash in this video have been where the flash has still remained on the camera, but it's just the light from that flash has just been manipulated a bit, um, so it's not quite as harsh. But you could equally have a trigger on your camera and then have a, a flash you know, off-camera, whether it be a, a small, uh, you know, sort of Canon flash, or whether it be something, you know, like a studio strobe um, to light your subject. You know, it depends on how quick and easy you want it to be, but potentially you could just, you know, take a picture with your camera, trigger a light elsewhere, and then you can manipulate and shape the lighting a lot more, a lot better than if you just have it like I've described here. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful to you and learning about the world of macro photography. I realize that this is quite an advanced lens to be using, um, but maybe if you're already familiar with the world of macro photography and you've been thinking about buying this lens, maybe you'll be encouraged and have more confidence now to buy it and feel that you will get the results that you desire. So don't be like me and take between five and seven years to get to the point where you actually feel like you're getting something out of it. Um, now, if you're not someone who has tried macro photography at all before, or you're very new to it, I definitely recommend you try out this lens. Now, you don't necessarily need to get the professional version. You can get the, the non-professional version, which I used for years and thought was absolutely fantastic, and I still think it's fantastic. I only really bought this one because I wanted the image stabilization. Um, so thanks for watching this video. Please remember to subscribe and uh, watch the other videos that I've got on my channel.